Welcome to Worship at Wycliffe. We're thrilled that you've chosen to worship with us today, and a few announcements as we begin. October 1st, the American Red Cross will host a blood drive here at Wycliffe from 1 to 6 p.m., and on October 13th, mark your calendars because the Wycliffe Fall Festival returns from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on that Sunday, October 13th. With that being said, let us pray and prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Gracious and almighty God, we praise you. We put our trust in you, maker of heaven and earth, of sea and sky, and everything that is in and on the earth. Watch over us, just as you watch over those who are far away from us. Sustain us, just as you sustain the fatherless and the widow. Reign in our lives by your Son, Jesus Christ. Prince of Peace and King of Glory. Amen. This is the list of the descendants of Adam. When God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them humankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth was father to Enosh. Enosh father to Kenan, Kenan father to Mahaliel, Mahaliel father to Jared, Jared father to Enoch, Enoch father of Methuselah, Methuselah father to Lamech. Now when Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son, and he named him Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the toil of our hands. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We continue through the characters of creation, and we come to a new place in God's story. The world is getting larger. There are more names. People are living for a long time. You'll remember, of course, that Early on in the beginning of God's story, in the book of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. God entrusted Adam to name all the potential companions, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air. So God trusted Adam to make decisions. It's a bold move. Of course, we've seen Adam and Eve make a a decision that brought about their expulsion from the garden, where God had to lay down a boundary, but in some ways still exercised grace with Adam and Eve by casting them out and not destroying them. With Cain and his brother Abel, we see Cain murdering Abel And God once again makes a boundary, offers Cain grace, and sends him away. It's it's not that Cain gets off easily, he doesn't. But we've just seen how sin has entered the world, how the possibility to make decisions and make bad decisions is right on top of us sometimes. But now in chapter 5, we come to this list of names, a long list of names, a a genealogy, the Ancestry.com of the Bible. We see that as sin has made its way around the world, as it's marbled itself into human experience, we see that God has not given up on the human project. Adam and Eve have a third child, His name is Seth, and Seth means to set, to a point, to firmly place. Seth implies a foundation. 
So with the name Seth, we can assume that, that God is, in a way, starting over. His plan has not been thwarted. His promise of redemption will march through the ages, even if it's carried by Seth and not Adam or Eve or Cain or Abel. So we see branches in the family tree. Cain is still alive. He's living far away, creating a city of his own with children of his own. Seth likewise begins to have children. And so we have here, as Daniel Darling suggests, a vivid description of the fulfillment of the curse of sin in Genesis 4 and then Genesis 5 with the elevation of faithful witnesses of Seth's, of, of Seth's descendants. But on the foundation, on the appointment of Seth, righteousness has a place in the world. And through his descendants, God will work that righteousness and trust in it, especially when it comes to one particular descendant of Seth named Noah. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. This is not normally the picture of God that we present at church. It's not normally the one I think we conjure up in our minds. God wanted to wipe clean the slate, and he was ready to destroy it all. But Noah found favor in God's eyes. Noah was righteous. Noah found grace. Somewhere along the line, you've probably heard that phrase, it only takes one. Well, it only took one for God to not destroy the entire world. It only took Noah, who was obedient, who followed God's rules, who followed God's direction to build an ark, though everyone thought he was surely crazy. Noah built an enormous boat away from water It surely must not have been easy for Noah, or his wife, or his children, but Noah prevailed. And I think Noah prevailed mainly because as the scriptures record several times, he did everything just as God had commanded. But he did that for a reason. You see, as the scholar writes, it, would seem that Noah's heart was turned toward what he could not see, toward the invisible God who ordered his steps. So Noah joined a large and long line of the faithful people. Generations before, there was Abel who sought the approval of the Lord rather than, than the safety of his own life. 
Generations later, Abraham left his home and his family to go to a place he didn't know, following a God he could not see. Still later, Joseph believed a God who allowed him to be sold by his brothers and wrongly convicted of a heinous crime. Daniel prayed to God and was willing to face slaughter by lions. The apostles would face Nero's sword. The early church would rather burn at the stake than deny Christ. Noah joins this line of witness. This is no living your best life now. Noah is a man living out his faith in obscurity. He is a mundane follower of God, but a faithful follower nonetheless. Noah finds God's grace, the same grace that the Apostle Paul talks about, the same grace that saves you and I, the grace embodied by the one who came so much later, who lived, died on a cross, and was resurrected for you and me. Now, Noah was not perfect. He was faithful, but he was not perfect. And that gives hope to you and I, for we too can be faithful, and perfection is not the goal, but faithfulness is. When Noah found grace with God and built the ark and obeyed God and did all of the things, he ends up telling us of a God who rescues his people from the water of judgment. It's like the scripture from Isaiah, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. We've seen Jesus pass through the waters for us, first in his baptism, where the Spirit took the form of a dove, similar to the dove that came down on Noah's ark so long ago, signaling the receding of the waters. We know that Jesus promises us that we who believe in him, as the scriptures have said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within. God promises each of us a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, in Christ there is therefore no condemnation. Noah's story is a story of courage, of faithfulness, and of obedience to God. May we do the same. Let us pray. Gracious God, you who created us and know our hearts, you know and see all that we do, all that we leave undone, all that we leave unsaid. Give us courage to use our hands, our feet, all that we are to make a difference in this world around us. We pray also for those men and women in our midst here in this congregation who are sick and who are hurting. 
We pray for those who grieve and ask your comfort. We pray, O oh God, for this nation, for this commonwealth, for this city. We pray for all your children around us. Remind us that you have called us to be in relationship with one another, not as a tableau of niceness, but help us to work things out. Help us to honor each other's gifts. Help us to pick up the pieces when things are broken. And remind us to pray as your Son has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.